All right. Hey, everybody. Welcome back. Uh, so in this video, we are going to explicitly uh, discuss the polar coordinate system and how we can measure polar coordinates um, and translate between polar coordinates and Cartesian coordinates for a given point in space. Um, so as a reminder, this is what we saw in the last video. If I wanted to describe a point, like the point 1, 1, uh, and that's 1, 1 in Cartesian coordinates, right? So that would be x comma y equals one comma one. Uh, we would describe that by moving, starting at the origin, moving one unit in the x direction and one unit up in the y direction. And so we would end up at uh, this point right here as our point one comma one. Um, however, we might be interested in discussing a point not by its Cartesian coordinates, but instead by its polar coordinates. Uh, and what we said last time is that polar coordinates take on two different uh, characteristics than Cartesian coordinates. While Cartesian coordinates tell us the amount we have to move in the x direction and then the amount we have to move in the y direction, polar coordinates tell us something different. They tell us first the straight line direction that we have to move from the origin to the point in question. So that's going to be that distance there. And typically, we denote that with an R for radius. Uh, and we have to know the, I'll grab a different color here, we have to know the angle that our point makes with the positive x-axis, right? So we identify where the positive x-axis is, that's right here. We identify where this, uh, this line representing R was drawn, that's right here and we find that angle that was measured between them, and that's our theta. And so polar coordinates record those two pieces of information, a measurement of radius and a measurement of angle, uh, rather than two measurements of distance, the way that um, our Cartesian coordinates did. So if this is the point one comma one, can we describe this in polar coordinates? In other words, can I identify my r and my theta? Uh, and it turns out we absolutely can identify this. Uh, and typically, uh, what we need to do is just a little bit of triangle math. Um, so what I'm going to do here, I'm going to uh, sort of identify a given triangle, specifically this triangle. Right, and I'm going to pull that out. So that triangle looks approximately like this. Oof, actually that's terrible. Let's try that again. Uh, our triangle looks approximately like this. Okay, great. Uh, and so the key pieces of information that we need to identify are the following. We've got our theta, that's this angle. We've got our r, that's this length. Uh, but the two pieces of information that we actually know are both of these side lengths, right, for the appropriate triangle. Um, specifically, because this was the point 1, 1 in xy coordinates, that means that this distance is really the amount we move, that's a distance of 1, and this amount here is the amount we move, that's also a distance of 1. So we actually already know what each of those are, right? This is one and one, uh, because those were our two Cartesian coordinates. Uh, and typically, I'll just explicitly point out the bottom of this triangle, or the, the sort of horizontal uh, side of this triangle, that's our x value, and then the vertical side length of our triangle, that's our y value, right? So we have uh, a right triangle because right? The x and y axes are perpendicular to each other. So this is a nice right triangle. We've got side length one on each of the two shorter sides. And so we can immediately calculate what r and theta are. Uh, and we get the following. To calculate r, we need to use the Pythagorean theorem. So we know r squared is equal to one squared plus one squared. And so r is equal to the square root of two. Awesome. Love it. And then for theta, right, we can look at this picture and we can identify that theta is equal to a 45 degree angle or a pi over four uh, radian angle, right? Because this is really a 45, 45, 90 triangle. 
right? In other words, whatever theta is, uh, this angle up here and this angle down here are the same. So it must be a 45, 45, 90. Um, if we didn't have this specific triangle, we can identify ways to calculate theta and we'll do that on just the next slide. Um, but I wanna uh, finish up here first and I just wanna explicitly say that because of this calculation that we just did, we can describe this point in polar coordinates is r comma theta equals root two and then pi over four. Uh, and this can get a little confusing. So I wanna, I just wanna say this out loud. These two representations are describing the exact same point, right? Both of these are describing this point in space. Uh, they're just doing it using two slightly different languages, two slightly different coordinate systems. So even though the things that are inside the, the parentheses here are different, they are simply describing the same point using two different uh, methods. Okay, cool. So we did this for this particular point, um, the point one comma one. Can we generalize this now to be able to describe any point in the xy plane using either Cartesian coordinates or polar coordinates. Or in other words, if I know what one of my coordinates is, like I, maybe I should say, if I know what my point is in Cartesian coordinates, can I always find it in polar coordinates? Uh, in other words, how do I translate between the two? Um, so that is what we will explore now. Okay, so when it comes to translating between the two coordinate systems, we end up with a very similar picture to start. Um, I'll sort of draw a generic uh, xy plane. Uh, I'll sort of explicitly identify the origin and I'll sort of identify an arbitrary point in question. Uh, I'm gonna draw this point just for the moment up here in the first quadrant. It makes my, my picture look a little bit nicer, uh, but we will discuss how or what would change if it's in the second quadrant, third quadrant, or fourth quadrant. We'll discuss that in just a moment. Um, so let's say that this is the point x comma y when written in Cartesian coordinates, right? And of course, what that means is that this distance right here is x, and this distance right here is y, right? So we can sort of mark off those two heights here and here. That's our given y height. This is our given x height. Okay, cool. Um, and we want to now describe this in polar coordinates, which means that we need to be able to measure that distance right there. That's going to be our uh, r. Uh, da, da, da. There we go. That's going to be our r value. Uh, and then additionally, we need to be able to measure the angle. That will be our theta value. Uh, and just like before, we can pull this triangle out, right? And we get a new triangle, uh, which we'll draw here. So a new triangle. Okay. And this time, instead of just having the side lengths one and one, they are arbitrary side lengths. Uh, this one was X and this one up here was Y. Uh, and then the question is, based on that, can we calculate what our r value is and can we calculate what our theta value is? Uh, and we absolutely can. The r value is a little more straightforward, right? We're sort of trained to recognize this as just the Pythagorean theorem once again. So in fact, we know that our r value can be calculated as the square root of x squared plus y squared. The theta value is a little less straightforward. The theta value, if we think about it, we can use our trig rules to calculate this, right? So the theta, uh, well, we know what x and y are, and we know that the tangent of theta, right? That's uh, Sokotoa. The tangent of theta is equal to uh, opposite over adjacent. And so we actually have this formula that tangent of theta equals y over x. And so therefore we get that theta will equal the arctangent or the inverse tangent. 
of y over x. Okay, and that gives us a way to calculate theta. So now we have our r value in terms of uh, x and y and our theta value in terms of x and y. What if we were given the other information, right? So what if we were given initially what our r value was and what our theta value was and we were asked to figure out what x and y were? In other words, what if we started with polar information and wanted to derive Cartesian information. Well, again, our trig rules will come to the rescue here. Specifically, we know how to calculate the sine of theta and the cosine of theta in terms of these different side lengths. Whoa, sorry, in terms of these different side lengths. All right, so if we do that, we will end up being able to calculate at our x value. Well, actually, let's put it this way um, if I wanted to calculate sine of theta, Right, sine of theta would equal, uh, well, it's opposite over hypotenuse, so that's y over r. And our cosine of theta, well, that's adjacent over hypotenuse, so that's x over r. And using these formulas, I can explicitly derive a formula for x and a formula for y. I can get x equals uh, r times cosine of theta, and I can get y equals r times sine of theta. All right. And so taken together, these four, uh, which actually I'm gonna go ahead and just write them all in a nice little box so that we can take a look at them. Okay, and here they are. Uh, we see in this box that we can convert from Cartesian coordinates to polar using these formulas. Again, that means that if we have our x and y information, we can calculate r and theta like this. Uh, and similarly, if we have our polar information and we want to calculate x and y, we can do so like this. Uh, the final thing that I need to say is to discuss what happens if we're not in this first quadrant, right? So if I'm not looking at a point uh, in between, or, or I should say with my angle, in between zero and pi over two, how does that affect this formula down here, right? In fact, this formula here is a little bit interesting, so we should explore that in more detail. Uh, let's see. Okay, so here is a new picture uh, with a new point that it takes place in the second quadrant, right? So this point here, we have a negative x value but a positive y value. Uh, and so if we did this, uh, let's take a look. Let's actually, I'm gonna make this an explicit point. Uh, let's call this the point negative one in the x direction and positive one in the, in the y direction, right? So this point is going to be the point negative one comma one. Now, how does this affect our computation of r and theta? Uh, well, Turns out r isn't affected at all, right? Because if I wanted to compute uh, the square root of x squared plus y squared as down here, notice this negative one would get squared, become positive one, and so I would still get that r is equal to the square root of two, uh, which is exactly right in this example. So in this case, r is equal to the square root of two. That's great. However, something kind of interesting happens when I try to compute theta we can see visually that theta should be equal to, let's think through this, uh, three pi over four, right? Because it's really going to be uh, first this whole angle right here. So that's pi over two, right? That's 90 degrees plus an additional 45 degrees. So 90 degrees plus half of 90 degrees or pi over two plus pi over four. So we can think of it that way. Okay, but if we pull out a calculator and try to calculate the inverse tangent of, let's see here, this should be one divided by negative one, we would end up calculating, um, we would calculate the arctangent of negative one, right? Because that's one divided by negative one. So the arctangent of negative one, and if we plug that into a calculator, our calculator will most likely give us the answer negative pi over four. 
And that's a little bit troubling, right? Because negative, uh, I should say pi over four, uh, negative pi over four, let me highlight the fact that there's a negative sign there. So negative pi over four is not equal to three pi over four. In fact, negative pi over four, right? Let me sort of highlight this in green. Negative pi over four is really the angle that we would get right here, right? That's negative pi over four. So what we're actually getting here is an angle that doesn't correspond to the point in question, but a point that's halfway around the circle. And this is because when you use the arctangent function, we know that the arctangent function typically lies between, I should say the output of the arctangent function, it typically lies between negative pi over two and positive pi over two. That's as a range, right? Not as a, as a coordinate uh, expression. So I should actually, I should probably rewrite it like this. There we go. So the arctangent function, when I plug in uh, an, a theta value, right? When I plug in some theta value, or when I plug in, you know, I should say any value, any value here, it'll end up being somewhere between negative pi over two and pi over two as our answer. That means that we need to have a little bit of geometric understanding uh, as we examine this picture. We have to remember where our point is in space, and if necessary, possibly add pi to it. Right, so that our arc tangent value, in this case, shouldn't be negative pi over four, it should be negative pi over four plus pi to flip it over into this quadrant. Typically, if our points fall within the first quadrant or the fourth quadrant, we do not have to uh, add pi, but if they fall within the second quadrant or the third quadrant, we will have to add pi. So a little bit of an extra wrinkle there at the end, but otherwise, this is how we would translate between our two coordinate systems. That's all for this video. Uh, stay tuned for the next one.